I worked with um, one guy who was quitting and I said, Bill, if you leave now, you're, it's going to haunt you for the next 20 years. He was like 60 and, and, and it's going to tear you up inside for 20 years. You're going to be a loser and you're going to know it. And there's, you can bullshit your way around it, but you're going to know it in your bones. But if you stick it out here for six more months, we'll kick ass and you can walk out of here a winner with your head held high. You'll be a better grandfather and husband. And, um, what do you have to lose? What the hell are you running home for? There's nothing there for you. You got to stay here. And, you know, I, I had like 30 seconds to make that pitch, but it stuck. It worked. Bill, Bill actually stayed for two years, but he totally kicked ass. We did a great job, saved the business. And, um, and, and he went on a hero and everybody recognized him for that. And I, I think more than anything, that's what people want um, deep down inside. They don't want comfort. They, they want they want to do something cool. All right, guys. Bang, bang. I've got Jeff here. Uh, Jeff, you are probably the number one turnaround artist in the United States, maybe even in the world. Uh, there's lots of crises that occur. Uh, some of it's mismanagement. And sometimes people just started a bad business, either a bad market, a uh, bad business model, et cetera. When you see the crises, how do you determine whether the business can be saved or it's just a bad business and it deserves to die? You know, um, for sure, everybody says, oh, it's it, it's external factors. It's the industry. It's something else. Um, and, and really, it's, you know, sort of manufacturing. You try to figure out what, what root causes, try to get to the basis of that. Uh, you know, if it um, if it really is industry wide, I worked with a, a computer reseller recently, and according to him, the all the manufacturers pulled back credit a couple of years ago. You know, so okay, if that's true and you're in trouble, what what's if is everybody else in trouble? Is are you the best performer? Did everybody else go out of business with this set of circumstances? What happened is that was universal, but then they everybody hit this pivot point like my credit's gone what do i do they made a horrible decision and went and got uh merchant cash advance money and that's ultimately what's killing them 47 million dollar business and um and there's just nothing left because the mcas are picking picking them alive um the so it's it's really that you know you talk to the owners and you just get a sense uh you know are, are they really committed are they goofballs are they are you know do they have the wrong focus somewhere else uh those sorts of things now when you've seen i don't know hundreds maybe thousands of these crises at this point i kind of mm -hmm. think of it like you're the firefighter the fire is blazing someone's called you up and said hey we come put out the fire what are the things that you see in the fire that would cause you to not want to go save it, right? Or like, what are the things that would turn you off from a situation? Is it people? Are there other things that are kind of the red flags where you're like, hey, even though I'm the best at what I do, I can't save that business or I don't want to go spend time doing that? Um, in general, there's no set of circumstances that'll scare me off. Um, probably my most radical was I got a call um, from a bank. The CEO committed suicide yesterday. Um, there's, uh, four felonies being investigated. Revenues have fallen from 46 million to 6 million and about to go to zero. And I was in there next day running the business. Um, because as long as I can draw a clear line of all that fraud and all those felonies happened previous to me. And, you know, in that case, I reached out to the, um, state attorney general and just said, Hey, I just arrived. If you need to arrest anybody, you know, give me a call. I'll have them meet you in the parking lot. Uh, but we're running a clean ship here and we're trying to fix the business. So it's not so much circumstances. It's really the people it's, um, you know, kind of if you if you think of um, Alcoholics Anonymous or a CrossFit gym, um, it's the people who come in and really are ready to change their life and really are ready to 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 go down a new path with passion and commitment. If I have somebody who's bullshitty, dick dicking around with like, oh, I think I want to lose weight. I'm tired of being 400 pounds, but you know, um, you, you can tell if, if they're not serious about. Why should I be more serious about fixing their problems than they are? Um, we once had a guy who was drinking himself to death, locked himself in his apartment when he should have been at work, was out of options, called AA, and AA said, we don't go and mug people with treatment. They have to come to us. Um, and, um, and, and that's kind of me. You know, when somebody's ready to change uh, in their heart, then, you know, they're my best client. I'm their best friend. 
but it's they've got to have that commitment and there's a lot of people who sort of dilly dally around the edges but aren't aren't ready to take that that plunge yet so you wrote this book corporate turnaround artistry fix any business in 100 days and when i read this i was like i got to talk to jeff like this this is a uh, bible it almost seems like in terms of corporate turnarounds it's almost 300 pages or about 300 pages and my number one lesson from this was your job is to motivate people like there's all kinds of tips, tricks, you know, hacks, all these different things. But at the end of the day, you got to motivate people to actually want to uh, fix these businesses. Can you give me a couple of examples of things that you've done to actually, when you walk in, there's the folks who kind of messed it up and then there's the people who are going to stick around. What are the things you've done to motivate people that you kind of now use as part of your playbook? You know, I, I would say if you step back, if you gave everybody in the world the opportunity right now, today you can relive the most heroic moment of your life or you can sit on the couch and take it easy. Um, they're all going to say, no, 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 I want to go relive the most heroic moment of my life. And that probably involved a lot of sweat, some pain, discomfort, fear, all these things that no one really wants. But we do as humans deep down inside because we know it's it. it it's worth it in the end. Um, so I think everybody has that latent urge to run up, you know, charge up the hill and do something awesome. Um, so for me, it's trying to define that in, you know, take a, a union shop full of a bunch of tough old guys who've been working in a factory. That's pretty easy because I just go in and talk to them like a high school football coach. And um you know, hey, listen, you, th this got all screwed up. Y'all had a bit of, uh, a bit of this because you weren't working hard enough. But what we're going to do is we're going to work hard. We're going to go kick ass. And you really need to motivate them. Everybody wants to go kick some ass somewhere. And um, and you give them like, we're, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go. And with a linear focus, people latch on to it. They love it. Now, I go into, you know, you take a pharmaceutical business. And I'm talking about let's do more with less, and they all want to do less with more. Um, that's just the culture where everybody's kind of overpaid and taking it easy. That's a lot tougher, so you have to get their attention. You know, maybe it's shutting down a division, maybe it's firing their boss, uh, but there's got to be some sort of um, thunderclap to get everybody's attention. And then once they realize they're fighting for survival, some will leave because there's an easier path, but a uh, um, a lot will stick out and 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 do the heroic battle to bring this business back, reclaim our pride, you know, and then you can leave. I I worked with um one guy who was quitting, and I said, Bill, if you leave now, you're it's gonna haunt you for the next 20 years. He was like 60. And 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 it's gonna tear you up inside for, for 20 years. You're gonna be a loser and you're gonna know it. And there's you can bullshit your way around it, but you're gonna know it in your bones. But if you stick it out here for six more months. We'll kick ass and you can walk out of here a winner with your head held high. You'll be a better grandfather and husband. And um, what do you have to lose? What, what the hell are you running home for? There's nothing there for you. You got to stay here. And, you know, I, I had like 30 seconds to make that pitch, but it stuck. It worked. Bill, Bill actually stayed for two years, but he totally kicked ass. We did a great job, saved the business. And, um, and and he went on a hero and everybody recognized him for that. And I, I think more than anything, that's what people want um deep down inside. They don't want comfort. They they want they want to do something cool. So I remember watching uh years ago Marcus Lamonis. Uh he had a TV mm -hmm. show called The Prophet. Yeah. And one of the, my takeaways from watching that, although there was you know cool stories and cool businesses and stuff, was sometimes he showed up and they were like, oh my God, thank you, Marcus, for showing up and saving us. Other times he showed up and they were like, get the hell out. Like, we want nothing to do with you. What is the receptivity when you show up, right? You're, you're known as the turnaround guy. Like, are they excited to see you? Is it a mixed reaction? What, what has that been like? It, it it's a mixed reaction um the screwballs definitely don't want me around the the people who you know the hard workers who feel oppressed do and then there's sort of a middle road of people who sort of do in their belly um one speech i often given you didn't walk in to this business or whatever 15 years ago with this shitty work ethic you don't tell your kids if your kids knew the shitty work ethic you're bringing in here every day they'd be embarrassed for you. If your parents knew, they'd probably slap you. Um, and you didn't walk in here like this. The culture brought you down. We're going to fix the culture and you got to, you got to bring the culture back up and the culture is going to bring you up. And that's the book. That's the bulk of the people. And, and they like that. They, again, they want to be part of a winning team. And, um, 
And they're willing to, you know, people were raised right. People have a good work ethic. They know right from wrong. It's just that the culture hasn't required or demanded it, that of them in a long time. And um, and they're actually relieved and inspired when when you do demand it of them because people people want to perform at their best. That makes complete sense. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the internal uh, changes that you have to go through. Uh, another thing that you talk about is one of the first steps once you get inside of these businesses is you immediately call up all the vendors and aggressively start renegotiating with them or, or trying to get some relief from them. Uh, it's not dissimilar from you know maybe a, a private equity firm like 3G is famous for you know being hyper hyper aggressive with a lot of these vendor relationships. And so, w- what is those conversations like? And what are some of the tactics that you've used? And now you say, hey. Whenever I've got to renegotiate, these seem to really work. This episode is brought to you by Cal.com. What do I have in common with Chad Hurley from YouTube, Toby from Shopify, and Alexis from 776 and the co-founder of Reddit? We all use Cal.com instead of Calendly, and we are all early investors as well. Cal.com is leading the charge of scheduling platforms in the open source sphere, offering you the chance to harness the efficiency previously reserved for elite corporations and tech gurus. If you like to have your calendar organized and be able to have an efficient exchange when scheduling, but you love all of the benefits of open source technology, then Cal.com is for you. They are transforming sophisticated calendar management into an accessible tool for all via a user-friendly interface. You can customize it and you can make your calendar work for you. Use code POMP for $500 off when you set up your team with Cal.com today. Again, go to cal.com, C-A-L.com, and use code POMP to get $500 off when you sign up. Cal.com, an open source tool that allows you to take back control of your calendar, be efficient when scheduling, and make sure that no one can steal your time. And I walk into a tough situation because generally um, payables are all aged, the vendors haven't been paid, and... um, and and I you know ideally I don't want to pay them anytime too soon because I don't have cash and I want them to give me a lower price which is probably impossible. So what I say is, here's a plan where you're going to keep shipping us. We're going to we're eventually going to deal with the past dues, but most importantly, I want to keep you as a vendor. I could replace you today, but I don't want to. I want to keep you as a vendor, but I need cash flow. I need I need additional terms. I need you know this that or the other some kind of grace from you. Once we solve the cash issue, then we're going to go over to the P&L issue because the company is not profitable enough. Then I'm going to really work you over for pricing and we're going to make it fair, but I want the sharpest price you have, not not the dullest price you have. And then once we solve the profit issue, we're going to go over and deal with the balance sheet. And that's where your past dues are, which we're freezing for the moment. Uh, And then we're going to find a uh, equitable way to deal with those. Worst case, we all know that bankruptcy um, provides the opportunity to work out debts, to haircut or stretch or what have you. I don't want to do that. I'm not threatening it. But we all know that's an option. So after we get to solve the cash and then we solve the profits, then we're going to deal with the debts fairly. Um, and we, you know, we'll have open conversations and see what the the company can afford to pay. And, and um you know, I'm thinking of like every damn client I have right now, they just can't afford, even when we fix the company, they can't afford the balance sheet because they just have too much debt. Um, and then it's really a conversation of, I mean, I got one right now. Um, I can give you 20 cents. I can I can pay off 20 cents on the dollar um, over four years, or we can just go into bankruptcy you can get 10% over three years. It's, it's your choice. But you know, let's be friends. Why not work this out out of court, um, keep the lawyers out of it and get you a higher recovery. But mathematically, you know, um, how how can you show me how I can pay anymore? Here's our projections. And um, emotionally, they'll fight, but eventually the logic part of their brain takes over and um, and they say, yeah, I I get it, unfortunately. Um, And you usually have to go through several people in the organization and get to CFO or president, somebody who can really understand in their lawyer who says, yeah, it kind of is what it is. And we, you know, we need to accept this. Does it change? Or, or, or when- they fight or they fight like hell. And then my number one mission is to get rid of them. Um, yeah. And, you know, and go give somebody else our, our profit or go allow somebody else to make profits on us for the next 10 years. Does it change at all when the vendor is a software vendor versus maybe somebody that's, you know, uh, providing equipment or some other kind of physical economy type product? 
Yes, um, only because of the cloud. It used to be, you know, you buy software and um, they'd say, well, we're not going to service you. And I'm like, fine, um, I'll call you when I need service. You know, I don't I don't give my plumber a monthly retainer. Why the hell would I give you one? Uh, but now they have cloud access. They can just turn it off. So it's all, it almost has become like a utility, you know, like the gas company. We just got to pay a monthly. Maybe we won't, you know, we'll put the old balances on ice, but we've got to pay monthly um either full or, or or partial but it's the yeah software has a lot more leverage than they used to now one of the uh quotes uh that i've heard over and over again that's probably one of my favorite quotes in business is that companies die by suicide not homicide and it's just them doing constantly stupid things um in the book one of the really stupid things that you highlight is you say google irs 941 prison and you call it the dumbest crime in America. Explain what this is, and then why do people fall victim to it? Um, so a 941 is the, as an employer, you, um, you're you a trustee for the withholdings for taxes from your employees, the employment taxes and whatnot. Um, and, and all it does is I take it from your paycheck and I give it to the government. It's not mine to touch or take, but when companies get in trouble and CEOs get in trouble, I say, well, geez, there's a bunch of cash. Why don't I just use that today and we'll pass it on to the government in a couple months? Um, the problem is the IRS has made this the number one, um, the, the the number one law to go after and punish. And when you Google IRS 941 prison, you'll find all these people who got uh, you know, um found guilty and are in prison because they try to play the 941 game. It's, you know, my, my first question is what the hell are you accomplishing? I mean, if you really have the miracle solution, yeah, maybe it makes sense to take that risk. If you really have the miracle solution, none of these people had the miracle solution. They were just hoping and dreaming and thinking I'll rip off my employees in the IRS to fund my delusional fantasy. And eventually, you know, the, the order fairy will come around. Um, of course, there's records. You know, I always say if you're going to rob a bank, go go in with a ski mask because they don't know who you are. When you're doing like white collar bank crime, they they know where the money went to. They have the accounts, they have the records, they have the EIN and numbers. Like, there's no possible way you can outsmart that kind of crime. Um, but people do it. It's impulsive, um, and it's it, boy, the IRS just hammers on folks. So when I come in and find that, we have to. Um, quickly deal with the IRS, make it known, come up with a payment plan and, um, and, you know, stay away from their, their sharp knives. So you mentioned delusion. And one of the things I immediately jumped to is there seems like uh, there's a growing number of entrepreneurs who don't have uh, what I would consider kind of just basic financial skills or understanding, read a p &L, read a balance sheet, understand how some of this works. Uh, and it feels like maybe those two things are related. Like you get increased delusion, the less that you are uh, well-versed in kind of core, you know, accounting or, or financial metrics. Uh, is that true in your experience where, you know, people just, if you don't understand the numbers, then dreams run wild and it leads you to ruin? Yeah. Yeah. Largely. Um, interestingly, people who really understand the numbers still delude themselves. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it's just, you know, it's, 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 it's a human trait, but you're right. The further you away, are away from reality, which is the numbers, um, the further you are away from reality. So in the book, you say, quote, few executives have ever thought of themselves as a chief profit officer, but that's what the leader needs to be in a recovering company. So the CEO or executive is the chief profit officer in a recovering company. How's that different than a normal company or a growing company? Or should they always be the chief profit officer or is it specifically during that recovery period where it's essential? They, they should always be the chief profit officer and somebody should always be. Uh, I entered a company recently, the CEO is the uh, on his business card and, and email, chief visionary. The number two guy was chief something else ridiculous. And I say, listen, Y'all got plenty of this vision stuff and y'all got plenty of that other stuff. Uh, what y'all don't have is profits or cash flow. And um, and somebody's got to quit that stupid job that means nothing to me and become the chief profit officer. You know, but I mean, you see it. Who wakes up in the morning and thinks I got to go shave some pennies today and I got to go add a couple basis points to my gross profit margin every day like they're a monk and it's the only thing that matters. 
people just don't do it um and 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 if you don't do that it, when times are good um then you're going to end up uh where times are bad you know probably chances are over time and um and it's just it's like the most fundamental mindset in the world but we kind of forget about it and um entrepreneurship and being executive and all that crap is so over um romanticized um and it has you know and 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 the romance has nothing to do with um scraping pennies but retiring or you know retiring with a big war chest has everything to do with scraping pennies you are probably very glamorous of course you are probably the epitome of a wartime ceo uh could you be a peacetime ceo like is it possible yeah. for you to run a business that's not in trouble uh, somebody else could, I, I can't. Um, and, um, and I, and I think there's a third, you know, there's a startup CEO, which is a different breed as well. Um, and usually when we buy a business, I'll run it for the first hundred days. And then, and then I think you need a one year person that kind of sets the foundation and really just starts doing reps and gaining momentum. We're going to do the basics over and over and over. And, and then the third ceo type would be the growth uh sort of return to normal and growth and i think they're com three completely different i can do the first two somebody else might be able to do the second two but i can't no i'd be a complete failure as a peacetime ceo now in reverse could the peacetime ceo be the wartime ceo in your experience occasionally you know these guys like bezos or zuckerberg that can take it from zero to gazillions I don't understand how somebody can have both temperaments um, and they're extremely rare. There are people that can do both the peacetime and wartime, but um, there, I, I'm not one of them and, and it's an extremely rare bird that can. Um, and I'll tell you the worst thing in the world is trying to, is fixing a company, getting it right, falling, not in love, but really believing that you're on the right path. And then the results aren't showing up and you need to turn it around again. Emotionally, I have this break where I just struggle to go in and and take apart the organization that I just built over the last two years. So I almost need somebody to come turn around me when I need to turn around. Now, uh, I asked a friend of mine, uh, Lulu Masveri, one time about uh, peacetime and wartime in communications. She said something to me that's just seared in my brain, which is there is no difference between peace and wartime. It is pre-war and post-war. And maybe that is what the Mark Zuckerbergs and the Jeff Bezos, right? They just, they're prepping for war and then they're kind of recovering from war and prepping, uh, prepping for the next one. I guess. Yeah, I I I it astounds me that you know the same person that can get this this little idea off the ground you know anybody who's been through a startup like it is so hard it's um just to get momentum and then to be able to do that in an organ you know organize and manage a company with a hundred thousand employees i it's just two different universes to me but the the, the occasional rare bird can do it there's another line in the book that uh, really resonated with me, which is the bottom line is that a turnaround will be some formula of raising prices, cutting costs, streamlining operations, and fixing bad habits. Can you give me an example of each one of these? And maybe we start with raising prices. Yeah, raising prices. Um, you know, the banal is uh, raising prices. The more aggressive is um, we've raised prices on, um, you know, so it's one thing we're going to raise prices going forward. It's another to say we're raising prices on our whole backlog that we haven't even produced yet, but we're just going to add an extra 10% to that and go tell the customers. The, the more extreme version is calling customers and saying, hey, and I've done this. Hey, we're in a bit of a pinch. Um, two things. One, we need cash, so you've got to pay us immediately, even though you have 60-day terms that you turn into 75. And the other is we're not profitable, so we're adding 10% to all the open invoices. So um, all the invoices you have, add 10% to them and pay them today, or we're not shipping any further. That goes over like a lead balloon, but you know, if you have leverage, it works. And and you, you know, I've saved businesses that way. Um, it upsets them. But a lot of companies would rather have a viable supplier than um, that than not. And if you have that kind of leverage, you can do it. Um, cutting so, costs. It. What, what about cutting costs? And what, what's maybe the most extreme situations you've been in there? Yeah, you know, cut. Well, I mean, you know, it, it's the easy ones. Like you find. I, just, I remember this 
guy was billing 75 hours a week. So 35 hours a week in overtime, and he had a 20 hour job. He was so bored that he started drinking on the job, became an alcoholic, crashed the um the um forklift, no, still didn't get fired. Um, you know, so you go in like whammo, there's there's a bunch of costs that just got cut. Um, you know, declare uh no more overtime without approval. And everybody fusses. And I'm like, just come and talk to me. I'll prove sensible overtime. Um, nobody does because 90% of the overtime was BS. Um then, you know, it, it, deeper into cost, you know, put put your major materials out to bid. Most people don't frequently bid their uh their supply items um and just get competitive market pressure going. And a lot of it's really Pareto analysis, you know, where the 80-20 and uh people do a lot of just, you know, they're wasting time on products that don't really work, ideas that don't really work. Just call them, focus on the on on what delivers the bucks and um you know, there's your cost cutting, um, streamlining operations. Again, that's pretty much Pareto. Um, you know, where are we sitting idle? I, I work on a lot of manufacturing, so it's a lot of industrial engineering. Um, you know, just work at uh, workflows process. Scheduling is probably the single greatest um, place for pickup and profit. It's a, you can have people looking super duper busy and you re-engineer the scheduling and you can just get out so much more um but it's it, it's scheduling and 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 it makes sense because processes develop over time um and just become cumbersome and awkward with lots of bolt-on steps and whatnot um scheduling is the best one for that and then um the bad habits you, you know family members soft work hours soft expectations um you, you know, are we here to provide people with a work-life balance or are we here trying to win the freaking Super Bowl? Um, you know, go get a work-life balance somewhere else. We're here to get, we're here to, you know, get to the playoffs and put some wins on the board and quite frankly, keep the business alive. We're not, we're not here for anything else. And I I fell into this early in my career. I thought we if we were more inclusive and we gave people what they wanted, it would work better. And when I rethought it of if I'm Bill Belichick or I'm the general manager of a team and my job's to win, I have no qualms about swapping out my third string quarterback for a different third string quarterback. But, you know, when you personalize and you treat everybody as family, it kills you to get rid of a third string quarterback because, you know, maybe they have some hidden potential and, and it that's not my problem. Um, you know, I'm here to, to staff a team and 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 win. Um, and you just got to bring in the get rid of, uh, or let me say it this way: you need to upgrade every position uh, rigorously and consistently. And if you do that, you'll have an all-star team. Do you think that it helps that you don't know the teams before you come in? Like absolutely, the fact, right? Abs the fact that you're an ex external person. Absolutely, because I have, I would have such a soft heart for so many people if I if I knew them um, without a doubt. And and that's my problem when I'm running a business after a couple of years, that becomes my blind spot. You know, I love Bob. Oh, sure. He doesn't move that fast, but God, what a sweet guy. And his wife's got problems. I'm such a sucker for all that. I talked to Graham Weaver, uh, who runs Alpine Investors. They're one of the top private equity firms in the world. And uh, mm -hmm. one of the things Graham told me is 100% of the time when they buy a business, they switch out the management team. And he said, you know, sometimes they keep the manager team, sometimes not. No one has a really hard, fast rule. He goes, 100% of the time we switch them out. And one of the things is, uh, one, you get your people in there, but also two is uh, it really changes the dynamic of the business because all of those personal relationships and, you know, everyone knows the person who's the good kind of smoozer, right? Who, who's able mm -hmm. to get different things in the business. If you don't have the personal relationship, all of a sudden it comes down to just, hey, what, what are the rules? What are the ways that we're going to run this business? Yeah. What what have you what what have you been accomplishing? What have you been doing lately as opposed to 20 years ago? Um and, and with uh, CTP, certified turnaround professional, which is the designation in our industry, um, sacrificial lambs is part of the study guide and part of the test. And you have to write about the value of sacrificial lambs um as part of the exam. And that is the public display of somebody getting shit canned where and it tightens everybody else up. I had one situation where uh, declared an end to um, to um, unauthorized overtime. It was a machine shop, so guys ran two machines each. One guy 
refused to turn his second machine on that day and said, if I'm not getting overtime, I'm not turning it. Why would I turn on my second machine? Which makes no sense. His supervisor didn't know how to respond to it. So he went to the manager. Manager was confused by this. They came to me. I'm in the office, freaked out, trying to figure out how to fund payroll. And I don't have a solution for that. And they give me this petty thing. And I said, listen, I'm so busy. Just bring him in here. Let me fire him right in front of everybody. Cause I don't have, I don't have time. I don't have more than 30 seconds to fire this clown. Um, and they said, okay. And they went out and said, listen, you're not turning your machine. Sands wants you to come in there so we can fire you in, in front of everybody in the office. And he, <laughs> he said, I think I'll just turn my second machine on. Uh, <laughs> and that was it. But you know, the word shot through the whole factory and, and everybody realized I'm serious and I don't play those games and we're here to win. And, um, and you know, it's nice to get a sacrificial lamb without actually having to throw somebody out the door. Yeah. But you, completely. you gotta change, you gotta change that thinking. You can't, you can't soft pedal change. As we have seen uh, over the last two years or so, tech companies, uh, especially early stage uh, kind of venture backed companies have struggled quite uh, mightily. Is mm -hmm. this turnaround playbook, can it be used in the tech sector as much as in a lot of the manufacturing or industrial engineering businesses you're talking about? I, I would say absolutely, because, um, you know, ultimately it's about uh, cost versus uh, revenues. And, um, but you got to have product market fit. I get tech companies coming to me that haven't achieved product market fit. And, you know, what do I do? It's like you're adrift in 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 the ocean and you've never seen land and you want me to navigate you towards land. Like I have no idea what to do. But if I can go into a company that like, well, we were profitable, but now we're not, fine. I just reverse engineer, like, okay, what changed? How do we get back to where we were profitable? That's pretty easy. But you know, people that have never been, I I don't know how to make them suddenly. And then real quickly tech also you know you've got your in there's generally two turnarounds income statement turnaround which is your profitability and balance sheet turnaround so you maybe you're profitable but your debts are killing you um tech has a somewhat different debt stack as well so that's going to be treated differently but you know on the surface it's um if gross margins are greater than expenses uh you're you're profitable and if not get them there so debt, I think, is a really interesting thing where most of the physical economy runs on debt of some form or fashion. Uh, in the tech world, most people are only familiar with either convertible debt, which really they just treat as an equity investment that yet hasn't been kind of finalized, or venture debt. Um, mm -hmm. Talk your perspective on debt and, and you know maybe what some of the hangups are and then also times where you've seen it work really, really well. This episode is brought to you by Freck. Historically, the wealthy had a hidden secret in investing. They would spend a lot of money and use very big teams to conduct tax loss harvesting. Tax loss harvesting is the timely selling of securities at a loss to offset the amount of capital gains tax owed from selling the profitable assets later. But now Freck is bringing this incredible advantage to any investor. They'll literally lower your tax bill, regardless of how much money you have. They use state-of-the-art technology through a product called Direct Indexing to allow investors to invest in the S&P 500 while getting all the benefits of tax loss harvesting without the big bill. If you want to learn more, go check them out at freck.com. That's F-R-E-C.com. I'm a big fan of the product, and I even became an investor in the business. Freck.com. Go check them out today. The I, I often say that this sounds ironic, but bank debt is, is one of the best things you can have is because it, it it the discipline and rigor of dealing with bank debt is so great that it keeps you focused and keeps you online. And I see we worked on a company this year that was trying to revolutionize some building product. They burned up $50 million, accomplished nothing. Um, you, you can't do that with bank debt. You can do it with friends and family. You can do it with equity. But you can't burn up that kind of money on a frivolous adventure with uh, with bank debt, and um, and that's what I kind of like about bank debt. It, it, the the rigor and discipline keeps you from screwing up to that extent. One of my mentors has like eighty companies. Every single one of them does a daily borrowing base certificate, where they you know if you're an asset based lending. Even the, even folks without debt, even companies that are incredibly profitable. Every single day they do a daily borrowing base certificate. What's the value of my receivables? What's the value of my inventory? How much can I borrow against that? What's my cash position? How much headroom do I have on cash? Um, 
And that's just, if you watch that, you're not going to get in trouble or you're going to see trouble coming, you know, months in advance. You're not going to be surprised by it. Same with the 13 week uh, cash flow forecast, which is somewhat similar, which works in tech companies or, you know, even asset light. Um, you know, we do 13 week cash flows for weekly for all of our companies and um, are always trying to see around the horizon uh, or over the horizon, you know, what could be coming, what, what's the downturn and, um, and how could we, how could we get in trouble that we don't see it? And that, but family and friends will never make you do that. Uh, equity investors will never make you do that. And um, that's why a lot of uh, tech companies just uh, flame out. Um, you know, the, the flip side is they're not going to get bank debt because they don't have assets and they don't have collateral. Um, and, you know, you can't borrow from a bank if you don't have either collateral or a hell of a um, proven earnings history, and, which obviously, you know, a tech startup doesn't. So, I'm going in a circle here, so they have to go to equity, but you know, and friends and family. But you know, equity and friends and family should be running a tighter ship. Um, but they don't, and um, I think I don't know. That's what I like about. Uh, that's what I love about manufacturing. It's also tangible. It's real, and um, and and it's if you do it right, it's um, it, it's hard to hard to lose your mind along the way. You mentioned a mentor. Uh, most people would say that you're one of the best, if not the best in the business. What have you learned from your mentor? Oh my God, all my mentors. Um, uh, everything. I mean, I learned a, I learned a turnaround game from a mentor. I learned the um, distressed investing game from a mentor. And um, I never purposely sought out mentors, but, um, but I've seemed to have always throughout my life had them, picked them up along the way. Um, I can't say, you know, when I was in high school, I wanted to, um, I wanted to be a professional football player and we lived outside New Orleans and some of the saints were moving to our neighborhood. I went and took, <clears throat> took over every single lawn contract of every single player in my town. And they all said, I got somebody doing my lawn. I'm like, you didn't understand me. I'm taking over your lawn contract. If it's price, I'll beat them on price. If it's service, I'll beat them on service. But Jeff Sands is going to cut Kenny Saber's grass and I'm not leaving. Um, and it was awesome. And then, you know, then they all became my buddies. And I got to spend a summer at, uh, in Vero beach at summer camp and fly around on the plane, the best thing in the world. And I kind of did that when I took a fancy to turnarounds, I found the best guy I could find and wouldn't, wouldn't leave him alone until we basically adopted me. Um, and then same with distressed investing. I wouldn't leave him alone. I just kept bringing him deals. And then, um, and then we started doing them together. That's there's best career path you can pick. Talk about the difference between turnarounds and distressed investing because they're related and they're somewhat sequential, but some people choose just to do distressed investing and some people want to just be in the turnaround game. And so why do you think that there's advantages uh, or opportunity in being you know, somewhat um, ad advantageous or expert at both of those things? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I think there's distressed investors who don't really do turnarounds because they're financial, they can run the numbers, they can do all the modeling. They can talk about it, but they don't know how to go on the factory floor and motivate people. Um, there's people who can go on the factory floor and motivate folks who just don't understand leverage finance and some of these other things, uh, you know, and how to successfully pull off a deal. Uh, you know, if you can do both, then you're, um, you know, if, if you can, if you can buy the pro take, buy or take over the problem and then actually go fix it. Um, I don't, you know, if you're a control freak like me, that's great because you can, you can see the whole problem and the solution and um, you don't have to depend on anybody else to get you there, you know, other than like your, you know, your trusted teammates. Now, um, another part of this that seems really interesting is uh, labor. Every single time I talk to anyone in the physical economy, they tell me labor's a problem. It's a restaurant, it's manufacturing, whatever. Uh, <clears throat> you have the uh, blessing of having to recruit labor to a crisis situation. It's one thing when you're the turnaround guy, you're the guy who's used to doing this, you're choosing to go do this, but now you have to convince people to come work at a business that's basically failing. How do you do that? How much of it is like, you just tell them it's failing and try to motivate them to come and help versus you got to show kind of the shiny, you know, uh, kind of rose colored glasses and, and sell them the dream. How, how do you recruit people to these crisis situations? Uh, largely selling the dream. Um, you know, often I, often I go in and uh, I remember one, everybody's like, boy, if Rick were here, you, you 
you should bring back Rick. Um, boy, if Rick were here. And I'm like, who's Rick? So I went on, oh my God, I got a bunch of stories like that where you just hear his name and then you go find a guy like everybody wants you back. They all thought you were the best. Here's what we're doing with the business. Here's your role. You can be the hero of this journey. Um, and what else you doing? You know, your your boss doesn't care about you. You're stuck. We're we're gonna love you and worship you. You got to come back. Others I just recruited in a um controller for a uh distress company that we don't have a solution for. She can see the numbers right there, but you know, the pitch is um, you know, you're gonna learn all about turnarounds, it's gonna be fun. Um, it's going to be a hell of a rollicking adventure. If it doesn't work, um, you know, go back and get a boring job. Uh, but you know, if it, if it does work, Hey, it works and you got this fantastic education and a great experience and I'll give you a heck of a reference and it's a thousand percent sale job. You know, I'm just, you're right. I don't have much to work with, but, um, I'm shining it up to the, as best as I possibly can. That makes complete sense. Um, in the chapter called Building Long-Term Value, you say there's four things that can be done immediately for a business. Uh, mm -hmm. One is get rid of the turnaround consultant. W w explain that. Like most people would say, wait, why is this guy saying get rid of the turnaround consultant? Yeah, well, you know, once the uh, the business is profitable, the balance sheet's cleaned up, I, um, I'm just taking up space. I'm billing a lot and I'm not providing much value anymore. And it's just, it's time for me to move on. Um, some turnaround consultants will not have the next thing lined up, so they'll try to stay there, but it, it's just time to get rid of them, get rid of that expense and move on. Um, yeah, sorry, that was uh, answering your question. The, the second one is maintain a monastic focus on the fundamentals of running a lean and profitable company. And that seems like maybe just like reinforce the good habits. Yeah, yeah, basically, you know, the it's Pareto, but it's just that that focus. And I, I don't know, how can you be successful at anything without uh, <clears throat> a monastic monk like focus on, on the fundamentals? And if you do that, you're going to stay out of trouble. Uh, and, and probably the reason you end up in a turnaround is you didn't do that. You got distracted by other stuff by chasing um, shiny objects. But if you just do the right things over and over and over and keep your life simple, you should probably avoid trouble. Number three and four is gain core strength and accumulate resources and then pick the right strategic direction now that you're lean and flexible. And it seems like rather than try to um, you know, improve your weaknesses to some degree, you're saying, hey, lean into the strengths and really kind of accumulate those resources. Explain that further. Yeah, it, it really is, which probably goes back to the Pareto. You know, what are we going to be exceptional about? Really clean up and focused and um you know, uh, book profits and just put them into retain earnings and strengthen your balance sheet. Don't go chasing shiny objects. Don't go try to create a new division. Just do your thing and do it well and get strong, get your feet super strong underneath you. Um, and then when it is time to go expand, you know, do that with just laser like intensity and don't, don't lose, don't lose your focus, your foundation, your laser like intensity. Cause everything other than that is just risk and it's a it's a tough world out there um and there's just bad you know so you, you like remember successories posters they'd say dumb shit like um you know uh, there's no such thing about luck it's just about preparation <clears throat> and every life coach who says there's no such thing as luck or whatever they all buy insurance because there's bad luck there's good luck and bad luck and um you know bad luck's out there and it doesn't matter Nothing else matters. If you get, I mean, I got, I lost a factory to a, I lost a factory in a home to a hurricane. What the hell could I have done to prepare for that? Um, it just, you know, bad luck's going to happen. There's fires, there's uh, tornadoes, and if you don't have a strong core, it, it 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 can be fatal. If you have a really strong core, you can probably weather the storm. Let's talk about liquidating a business or liquidating assets. Uh, mm -hmm. In these crisis situations, you need cash and you need it quickly. And so selling some of the assets uh, potentially could help you do that. But a lot of times, especially if you're selling a, a business unit or, or something that isn't just a physical asset, uh, could take a long time. Even a real estate deal could take a long time. Mm -hmm. And so how have you in your career kind of expedited these sales and really ensure that you get the cash as quickly as possible? Um, you're, you're right <clears throat> that it can take time. and um the more of a hurry you're in the lower the price you're going to get you know for a piece of equipment or real estate it's more than anything um 
if you think of yourself and then you think of all your stakeholders, your customers, your vendors, your lender, everybody else, they all have balance sheets. What you're trying to do is pull cash off of their balance sheets onto yours. Um, and then, uh, and and then at some point you 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 push the the cash back onto theirs as you get through this hole. You know, if I got a piece of real estate or equipment, I can um, I can sell an option in it. I can sell part of it. I can borrow against it. I can take a hard money loan against it while I'm going for a sale. Um, maybe I can get the bank to advance me a little bit more if we have the real estate listed. It's how do I get cash from other people's pockets into mine so I can I, I I can you know pay great working capital, pay for my expenses, keep keep my employees going, buy materials, and spin that and then I'll, I'll ultimately generate profits and then be able to push that back out. And most people, if you say, hey, I'm just going to borrow from you for a little while and then I'm going to give it back, but I've got a bomb proof plan. We're going to track it every day. I'll be hundred percent transparent. They'll, they'll buy into it, um, you know, because they want a customer, or they want a vendor. Um, and they'll, I, I always, you know, if, if you got a good plan, people will support it. If you got a, if you don't have a good plan, people aren't going to support that either. And and the world's just full of plans that aren't that great. When you go in, uh, how much of it is you come up with a plan yourself and then you approve the plan yourself and you go implement the plan versus you're looking for kind of consensus, right? Whether it is with uh, investors, whether it's maybe some people at the business, how, how do you just think about, you know, setting the plan and then actually approving that plan? Um, the It's a great question. Um, the you know, I walk in as beleaguered as the entrepreneur is. I mean, some there's just some bad CEOs, but usually I say, you're still the most qualified person in the world to run this business. You don't feel like it. You've really had your head kicked in, um, but you're the single most qualified person to run this business today. And then I get them to give me the ideas. How do we get out of this situation? If they can't come up with that, with that or you know so often i'll take their disjointed ideas and put into a plan if they don't even have disjointed ideas then i basically come up with a plan myself um there's no consensus there's uh absolute buy-in um i don't need everybody to think it's a swell plan i need everybody to get behind it and execute on the plan whether they like it or not and everybody's free to leave and sometimes people have to leave but it's it's about the execution. And, you know, if you leave it up to the inmates to come up with a plan and execute it, I mean, there's a reason I got called in the first place. Um, and it's not because y'all were doing a great job. When you think about um, maybe external pressure, another thing that's really interesting is uh, in these, let's say, a local town, people know. Mm -hmm that there is a crisis happening. And so whether it is kind of the whisper network and, and you know people go to the bar at night and they're talking about it, or maybe even the local papers writing about the problems, <clears throat> et cetera, that kind of compounds some of these issues. How do you deal with maybe the soft stuff, right? It's not numbers, it's not you know the actual business itself, but you're trying to almost manage expectations or, or maybe change the narrative around the business in the local community. It it's really hard, um, and as you can imagine, entrepreneurs personalize their business. It, it it's part of them. Um, you know, I get some that won't won't cut the country club membership because they're afraid of how it'll look. And I get on the other side, I get people who just bravely go into bankruptcy. Will call the paper and say, "Hey, we're going to file. It's going to be news. I want you to have the inside scoop. And this is what we're doing. And this is why we're doing it." They'll go to the trade show and deal with all the vendors who haven't been paid. And um, it, it's I, I have one of those now, but it's rare to have somebody with that sort of courage. The employees is tough. And the toughest part of the employees, like I can talk to people all day long and you know pump them up and tell them it's going to be okay. And here's our plan, all that stuff. And they go home and their spouse starts nibbling at them or their jerk brother-in-law starts nibbling at them. You're like, oh, I heard blah, blah, blah that's really hard to overcome. And, you know, Monday, everybody needs to be built back up and you lose some in the process, but yeah, you're totally right. That how it plays out in public is um, fragile is probably the best word for it. Last question I have for you is uh, in the book, there is a quote, uh, and I think it's in the beginning of the book. It says, despite being impatient and relentless, Jeff is the happiest guy on earth. 
And there's some sort of uh, dichotomy almost of like, you're running into the fire every single day. You're just seeing absolute, you know, uh, uh, everything in shambles. Businesses are failing. People are stressed. Uh, there's all kinds of uncomfortable, tough situations or conversations. Yet you remain really happy. How do you do that? Well, number one, it's not my neck in the noose. Um, and when it was, my first two turnarounds were my own business. And, you know, I was looking at losing my home. Um, that wasn't fun. But I love untangling big, complex problems that other people can untangle. And um, the ability to do that and have all this action and not risk losing my home is, I think it's just the coolest thing in the world. Um, and I often say, I, you know, I hope on my dying day, on my deathbed, somebody calls me to talk about deal structure. Because I'd 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 love to love to have one more one more conversation on buying a distressed asset uh, before I check out. I Just love it. <laughs> so Jeff, you wrote the book "Corporate Turnaround Artistry: Fix Any Business in 100 Days." I highly suggest people if you have not read this yet, please go pick it up and read it. It's a fantastic book, and and I think part of uh, what makes it so good is very practical, obviously, but um, it's also uh, looking at these turnaround situations, and it really can reinforce and teach good habits and and things that you should be doing with a healthy business as well. So it's, it's focused on turnarounds, but it, it's really about how do you run a business correctly and, and avoid these mistakes. Um, I've learned a lot today. Uh, I appreciate your time. Where can we send people to find you? Or uh, if somebody unfortunately has a turnaround situation and needs your help, where, where can they get in touch with you? Um, so my website is dorsetpartners.com, D-O-R-S-E-T partners.com. Uh, you can find me there, Jeff at Dorset Partners, my email, I'm on LinkedIn and um, Twitter and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, and you know, I, again, my dying day, um, I love these conversations. I love getting phone calls and um, the, the, yeah, I, I get such a kick out of this. It's, I, it, it's not work for me. <laughs> I love to hear that. All right, Jeff, thank you so much for doing this. We'll definitely do it again in the future. Thank you, Anthony. It's been a blast. Take care.